that note, let's let's get started. So we're very honored to have um, Dr. Mungo today. And uh, before we get started, let me just say uh, just a few um, comments about Dr. Mungo, and then we can start. And as before, we can have the last, you know, 10 minutes or so for questions and reflections. Uh, so uh, it's an honor to have Dr. Mungo today. She is an assistant professor in obstetrics and gynecology and physician scientist at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. She earned her medical degree uh, from the University of California, San Francisco, and a master in public health from the Johns Hopkins uh, School. Her research is focused on improving secondary prevention of cervical cancer in low and middle income countries. Specifically, she's investing investigating the feasibility of self-administered in, intravaginal therapies for HPV and cervical precancer treatment in those settings. Dr. Mungo was recognized as an ASCO Young Investigator in 2021 and 2022 and received the American Association of Cancer Research Global Fund for Women's Cancer's Career Development Award. Her work is supported by the National Cancer Institute, the University of North Carolina, Einberger Comprehensive Cancer Center, among others. So it is my privilege to introduce Dr. Mungo. And as as always, um, feel free to you know put a, put your questions in the chat as well as after her talk. So welcome. Hey, thank you so much. Uh, thank you everybody for having me. Um, as I mentioned to Kimberly and Julie, uh, at a, a small. Um, flight changes and delays. So I'm actually giving this at an airport. You might hear some noises in the background, but I will make the best of it. Um, so such a privilege to be here. Um, and um, I was seated in your shoes about um, six years ago and very happy to share my experience and my journey with the hope that you learn something from it. Um, I plan to talk for about 30, 35 minutes and then um, we're very happy to have questions, etc. Um, so <clears throat> let's see. So just you know, I'm going to talk about sort of my background. Uh, the goal is to make it as relatable as possible and um, uh, to demonstrate what um, you know can be a path that um, is seen as successful and you know things I learned along the way, things that have gone well um, that you can all learn from. Um, so I have, you know, no financial disclosures. Um, I always, you know, say like, uh, there's something called positionality. It's an American term, but basically, you know, I was previously a Gokal fellow. I'm, uh, I'm Kenyan American. So I migrated to the United States, um, did medical school in the U S and became an obstetrician gynecologist, did residency there, um, did a Gokal fellowship, um, and, um, eventually became an American citizen. So my experiences are shaped by this, um, but very much, um, I hope, especially those of you who are international can have um, a perspective or learn things from my experience. Um, I always start to the end, which um, I think if I, um, things I, you know, kind of big picture pieces is um, in doing this work, is you know start with your why um why are you doing this and there's a phrase um that i paraphrase here that says he who he who has a strong or she who has a strong why can endure almost anyhow um so you know this path of being a researcher is not easy certainly there are other easier paths but always kind of remembering what your strong what your why is has helped me um progress in my my path uh the next one is something that i learned actually from i Somebody said this, I think, at the GLOCAL orientation meeting that you have in June, that you had at the beginning of your GLOCAL, that this global health is a writing business. Um, and it's true. Um, you know, we are all here to change the world, to make the world a better place, to improve health outcomes. Um, but from an academic global health perspective, really the way you do that is to write. Um, it's not very fair. It's definitely a Eurocentric way of seeing the world. Um, but you know, um, at least um, from academic global health, where a lot of the currency is papers and grants, um, it comes down to writing and learning to write and getting comfortable with writing and rewriting and failing at writing. Your first seven, 10 drafts will not be great. 
but your 15th one would be really good. And next time you write your you know, second draft will be better. So, you know, that's something that somebody said who's very successful. And I always remembered that. Um, I've also learned that research is like a small business. Um, again, as you grow, you'll realize that you're kind of, um, you know, as being an investigator, now a fellow, eventually the goal is to become a principal investigator. You, you know, you're bringing in grants to you know, lead a research area, but, you know, you are at the center and you have to invest in your writing skills, in your ability to read a lead a team, uh, to manage people, to manage money. So, you know, thinking of it as a business is a way that others have also said, um, and it's different because, you know, like I'm trained as a gynecologist and a surgeon, but um, to be a successful researcher, you it's a different mindset um, and you learn it along the way. As you go through your path, embrace being specific in your area of research. Don't, you know, work on cervical cancer today, tomorrow breast cancer, tomorrow implementation science, tomorrow, you know, clinical trials. Uh, people who are really successful stay very narrowly, especially begin in the beginning. Later on, you can um, broaden. Um, you know, there's no free lunch, lots of sacrifices along the way, but knowing your why um, helps to kind of buffer those sacrifices. Um, and then this is something that also somebody told me is your weakness is your superpower. And I'll talk about that later. Um, but, you know, seeing the things that you might not be strongest in or something that could be... Um, you know, like a negative, really can turn it into a strength. Um, so, you know, this is my journey. So I was born and raised in Kitale, which is a small town in Western Kenya, um, you know, agricultural town. Um, there's, you know, there's electricity, but no movie theaters and no fancy this and that. Um, I was you know, a middle-class kid. My dad had a job and we had a car, but we were not wealthy. Had um, So, you know, middle class small town um i did well in in primary school um and mm-hmm. went to what is called a national school in in um in in kenya so it was like you know i was maybe one of the top five or some something girls in in the district at the end of high school of primary school and i went to a good high school that set the foundation and this is important because again you know Fortunately or unfortunately, uh, being successful in global health re- requires you to write a lot. And some of those foundations that some of us had or didn't have matter, um, but it can certainly be overcome. Um, I moved to the U.S. Um, and um, did my undergraduate in the U.S. and she knew I wanted to become a doctor. And when I was choosing where to go to medical school, um, I went to UC Berkeley for undergraduate, which is you know in California. Um, and I was looking at medical schools, so UCSF um, stood out to me because of um, Craig Cohen, who so many of you know, who uh, had been working in Kenya for a long time, had a collaboration with the Kenya Medical Research Institute, and I knew that I wanted to have a path, a career path where I'm doing work back home in Kenya. So I chose UCSF, went to, to go to UCSF because of that strong international collaboration. Um, and then during medical school, I, I did an extra year, so I applied for what is called like a, a year-long research fellowship. So med school is four years in the States, uh, but I took an extra year where I spent basically a year in Kenya at an HIV clinic, working um, with a mentor who at the time was one of Craig's um, mentees. Um, and, you know, as a very fresh medical student, kind of got exposed to what research is and, you um, that mentor was working on basically integrating cervical cancer screening into an HIV program. And I kind of just observed, you know, your med students don't really have much skills, but I got to see how research, you know, and I got to do some, you know, basic research. Um, but I got to, you know, I think that's where the the seeds of being a researcher was planted because I saw what the potential for an opportunity of being a, a researcher and a career in research could also be integrated into what I wanted to do, which is um, do work in East Africa. Um, so I finished medical school and I, I did a master's in public health along the way, which, um, you know, pros and cons of, you know, when to get a master's degree if you don't have it. Um, I went to a uh, joint residency, so I knew I wanted to be take care of women. Um, and I went to residency in Abidjan, and you know, definitely this was the hardest time of my life. Despite you know having moved countries, and you know, when I moved to the states, my parents you know couldn't take care of me. I, I worked in McDonald's, you know, did odd jobs to you know pay you know school fees, whatever. Um, 
but despite all that, you know, doing a residency in the U.S. as really as an African and an immigrant was very challenging. Um, definitely almost quit <laughs> many, many times. Um, but I always remembered my why. And that's kind of what um, got me through. Um, and then I um, I applied for the Girl Cow Fellowship, which is what you all are doing. Um, and the fellowship is only for one year. So I have sought funding through another fellowship um, at UCSF through what's called the Center for AIDS Prevention Studies that gave me funding for an extra two years. So I ended up doing a three-year uh, fellowship. Um, and again, this is when I really learned to write um, and to, yeah, to write both grants and papers and, and just learning to write, you know, going through those 15, 20 drafts that you go through with your mentor that really teach you how to think and write better. Um, and then at the end of fellowship, so as you all know, an ideal successful transition is to join a faculty job that um, gives you protected time for research. Um, because, you know, we you know, research takes time and you, know, you, you really can't be a researcher if you're doing 80% clinical work, meaning you have one day a week of research, you, you know, you can't lead your own projects. So, um, I'm currently an assistant professor at UNC, and most importantly is I am on something called a K-12, like it's kind of like a K where you have 75% protected research time, which allows you to really, you know, spend most of your time in research um, and, you know, have increasingly become successful. Um, so, you know, what's my why? Uh, so, you know, this is a picture of me when I was a little girl. Um, this is in my village. Um, and these are pictures of my grandparents. Um, and so, you know, I grew up in Kenya and, you know, was um, middle class, but, um, you know, it was this girl, little kid who saw a lot of injustices and that women faced. Um, so poverty and gender um, kind of, and weak health systems most affect women most, um, you know, because women interact with the health system a lot and issues of patriarchy. So, you know, I grew up you know, with a deep desire to really improve the lives and health of African women um, and wanting to kind of use my career to do that because of, you know, you see um, how women are ostracized from an, um, a teenage pregnancy because they don't have access to contraception. You know, somebody loses birth, a child because of lack of access to emergency obstetrics and then is ostracized. So all the things that women pay a deep price when poverty, um, when they face poverty. Um, and so that has been my why. Um, and I put some quotes there that have kind of helped me say the course. Um, again, the issue of having a strong why. Um, and then I like this, this quote where they say that the world needs your light, do what sets your heart on fire. Um, so again, I think, you know, no path is easy and research is not the easiest path, especially if you have an option of being a clinician or a physician. Um, because at the end of a residency, you're very good clinically and you can make a lot of money clinically. Um, but, you know, at the end, like what's setting your heart on fire? What makes you want to wake up and makes you super excited? So for me, this was it. Um, and that's what led me to invest in three years of being a fellow when you're making very little money, but you're training to become a researcher. Um, and then this last quote is something that a professor at USC, UCSF said that, you know, it's um, very true that really at the end of the day, it's not how smart you are or your opportunities or your background, whatever. I think at the end of the day, it's like being resilient and how much your, your persistence and staying the course can dictate how far you go. Um, and, you know, oftentimes I'm not being the smartest person in the room, um, and especially in research. But if you really want to, if you're willing to resubmit that paper, you know, redo that draft for 10 times until your, your mentor likes it, um, your resilience tends to take you through. Um, so just quickly, my funding journey and um, to help folks kind of get a sense for it. So, you know, in medical school, I invested a year to do research. Um, I got exposed to my field, which is cervical cancer in women living with HIV. So with PEPFOR, the, you know, HIV now is a, um, a chronic disease. People live with it for a long time and lots of gains have been made. Um, but 11, you know, mm -hmm. over 14 years ago or so, um, they were just integrating cervical cancer screening into HIV programs um, in Sub-Saharan Africa. And, you know, as a medical student um, and, you know, resident, so training in the U.S., you never really see anybody with cervical cancer. Um, 
in the ward, certainly don't have a ward full of women dying from cervical cancer. Um, and being uh, at this clinic for a year and then spending time at the hospitals, I saw the drastic difference and you know, due to lack of primary and secondary prevention. Um, so, you know, I found an area that I, you know, has needs, is fundable, and that aligned with my, you know, passion of trying to address injustices that, you know, fall on women uh, in the setting of, you know, poverty. Um, and from investing that year, I got my first publication and kind of, you know, felt like this is something I could do. Um, I graduated, thanks to this publication, I graduated med school with a distinction in clinical and translational research. And that helps, you know, with your residency placements and just opportunities. And, you know, it, this is also, again, it's always an investment. Um, some people say taking a year, it's certainly an, it's, there's a finance, if you think of just more, the financial costs because a year less of you making money as a physician or whatever, but you invest in this because I got exposed to what now made my career or made me stick through it, but also it um, gave me the publication, some skills in writing and, you know, and thinking that then informs the rest of my path. Um, and then I got my master's along the way. I joined the sorry, the Glocal Fellowship, and unfortunately, a year is not enough. Um, I think when I was at the Glocal meeting, I said I did this should extend scholarship to two years, um, and two years okay, but even three sometimes is better. But the more time you, and especially because the goal is to transition, um, so you know the goal is to get a project, learn to write, to be an expert in a small area, or you know baby expert, but also to really set yourself up for the next stage, which is usually a faculty job with protected time. Um, and faculty jobs with protected time tends to be like a K or some other grants that, you know, buys your time so that, you know, you have time to do research. Mm -hmm. And often you need, so, you know, if you're a Glocal Fellow, maybe you have a year of setting, doing your research and then maybe a year of publishing. And then that second year is when you're now writing your your K or whatever is the grant that will get you to the next stage. Um, so I definitely recommend folks to find the opportunities to ha have other ways to, fund, to be funded, to have more time, because it's a year is not enough time to do research, publish, and then write a grant or a K or something that can set you up for the next stage. So end up taking three years, which again is another investment. Um, you know, when you finish an OBGYN residency in California or anywhere in the US, you could like make a lot of money <laughs> the next day. But I was like, oh, I'm going to go be a fellow um, and, you know, just still live in my tiny apartment. But, you know, it was a worthwhile investment. Um, and, you know, in these three years, um, so, you know, I, I got to get, I got uh, my first kind of decent size grant, which was a UCSF Global Cancer grant, where basically, you know, trying to think about different ways to different projects and improving cervical cancer screening in lower so settings where that nurses do screening. I wrote a proposal that got a 50,000 grant. And then there's also some, there's a center for AIDS prevention studies that both UCSF, UCLA have. I also got another maybe 25 or 40,000 grants that supported my research. Um, and then uh, most importantly, I got time to write my, my transition, you know, grant, which is, um, you know, how do I get, so, you know, ideally after a fellowship, you don't go back and do be a full-time clinician <laughs> because a, a global health fellowship is trying to teach you to train to be a researcher because, you know, research is one way, especially in global health, to advance field, that, you know, health on a bigger scale. So, you know, the goal was how do I get a job after that does not mean I'm seeing patients for four days and I have no time to do research. Um, so I wrote, you know, uh, basically, this is like a K grant, and these things are really tough. It was, you know, again, a really, really challenging time. You know, writing that specific aims page, you have to go through four, five, six, seven ideas, and then finally, the aims are correct. Now you have to write the thing, and you know, it's a, a whole six or eight months of mostly writing. Um, again, an investment, but um, you know, you next time you write something like this, you don't start from the beginning. Um, so it's definitely worth it, even though at the at the time it's you know quite a pain. Um, and as you all know, you know, again, persistence is the name of the game. When you submit these things the first time, they often don't get funded the first time. You know, at some point you learn about scores. So my first score was 36, which is not really good. Like it's so good to be scored because when you say, you know, you work on something for six or eight months of a lot of full-time writing. 
and sometimes it's not even discussed, meaning like it didn't meet the 50, only 50% are discussed. So sometimes you submit and, and it's, it's in the less than 50% pile, which, you know, is deflating, but it happens. But thankfully my first submission was in the top 50%, which meant I got a score, but the score was not fundable. So they give you things to re uh, improve. Um, and then I, you know, you, you improve it. I, um, I resubmitted and in my second submission 18 is a fundable score um, so you know and this is why you, in fellowship you need more than a year and ideally you need at least two because you know if you, if you submit and then in six months you get a score and then you resubmit and then you wait another six months or so so um, and so anyway so I got the opportunity I got the experience of writing an, an NIH grant that eventually was fundable um, I ended up, um, uh, let's see, okay, so when I finished my fellowship, actually, rather than, um, I, I got a, a better fitting opportunity at the University of North Carolina, which had an internal K grant, so I was going to stay at UCSF with this grant uh, that was fun, fun, going to be funded, um, but then UNC came with a better opportunity it was a, uh, at the time a strong a better environment for for me so i moved to unc with a faculty job in the fall of 2021 again with a you know similar like they call it an internal k so you didn't have to apply for it yourself but you apply for the job and you get chosen for the job as a scholar and you you, you know this k is paying 75 percent of your salary so you only need to do 25 percent clinical time so i've been at unc since then um and certainly you know getting to be in junior faculty i've learned has there's a lot um of opportunities for funding um because you know research requires um young people who are hungry passionate have ideas <laughs> as somebody thinks so is also people i here for people so generally research likes to find there's a lot of grants for young young investigators and they, and especially junior faculty because they know that you know if you can be you know investing in the future basically um so i found as being a junior faculty there's actually you know a lot more opportunities for 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 funding um so you know the k you know comes with 25 thousand dollars of funding each year for a project but you can spend you can spend very little of it abroad and i'm a global health researcher so that meant i had to write grants to fund my research so the k paid for my salary which is great i mean the best thing you can get at the time um but the, there was just not enough money to do research so you know i, I you know wrote grants so that's the year i got this american association of clinical oncology young investigator award which is fifty thousand dollars and there's something called the NCI AIDS Malignancy Consortium. Again, these are things that tend to be out there. You know, apply, apply, apply. For everyone you get, there's only one or two you don't get. Um, and these kind of, you know, funding. So I was able to have a research team in Kenya and have you know, an ongoing project. Um, and um, and then, you know, the, you, the cancer center, so wherever you are, UCSF, UCLA, the cancer centers tend to have grants as well as a center for AIDS uh, research CFARS they also tend to have grants and will, they want to invest in junior faculty because they know that that's a pipeline to get you know folks who are senior investigators who will hopefully change the field um so I you know I got funding that's supporting my work um and then you know there's a Google Scholar Research Award which I encourage everybody to look up this actually anybody can apply their no citizenship requirements um as opposed to some of these other ones even the ASCO ones tend to not have citizenship requirements and this google scholar at least when i applied is rather easy um and then you know the biggest grant most more at least sequentially was um in you know two years ago again you know i so i signed up for a lot of like grants websites i get emails and i you know look up what's potentially good and this is a really excellent one that actually i think was the first year being funded uh it's called the victoria secrets global cancer it's a global women's cancer Re development career development award it's um funded through the American Association of Cancer Research. So it's basically women doing can cancer research globally. Um, there's no citizenship requirements, so anybody can apply. Um, and this was my first kind of biggest grant, at least at the time. Um, and some of these, especially non-NIH grants, tend they're shorter, so, you know, four, 
four or six pages. You don't have to do like facilities, like, you know, a typical NIH grant is like, you end up submitting like a hundred pages, which, you know, eventually is what you want because there are lots more money. Um, but initially the smaller grants actually can give you enough money and they're much faster. Um, so this is one that, you know, I got to support and sequentially supporting the work. And I won't talk in detail about like my, basically my research areas, you know, secondary prevention, how to improve screening of cervical precancer and treating precancer in your resource settings. And, you know, within that umbrella, there's a lot of like different things. How do you support, you know, healthcare workers who are often nurses who are doing screening, you know, gynecologists don't do screening in the resource settings. How do you optimize treatment? How do you ensure quality of treatment? And then now, you know, realizing that there's just not enough trained people to offer pre-cancer treatment um, and part of why cervical cancer incidence is so high in low resource settings is increasingly people are getting screened, but when you screen positive with a pre-cancer access to treatment is so weak, like less than 40% in Kenya got, get treated. So now my research is looking at, can women use the self-administered treatment to, you know, and there's precedence for this. Um, so, you know, so for example, this, this career development award fund is funding a feasibility study to look at, is it feasible? Is it safe, acceptable? women to use a self-administered treatment when they have pre-cancer. Um, and that idea came through, you know, setting off just spending time 10 years before in clinics and seeing how things are. And over time, you know, going to conferences and seeing what's happening, what are the gaps, et cetera. Um, and, um, and then, um, oops, okay, a second. Okay. All right. So, and then um, this, like in the last year, uh, another great, funding opportunity that I was privileged to get is something called the Gilead HIV Scholars Award. So as many of you know, HIV is heavily funded. Um, so if aligning your research with HIV <laughs> helps you have more opportunities. And this is another uh, award that's a career development award, meaning it funds young or oh, junior investigators. Pretty good money, 180,000. That also, I'm pretty sure it's open regardless of citizenship. Uh, and it's not very long, so something for people to look into. Um, and um, and then, you know, I took the dive and wrote my first kind of, well, this would be my second, because this was the k and Finals and NIH grant. But in my second year of my faculty, you know, again, signing up for, for stuff, and I, I learned about something called an R34, which is basically a clinical trial planning grant. It's a, you know, a grant to help you plan a bigger trial. Um, and you know, I attended the pre the the pre whatever um you know webinar where they talk about what the grant is, and I was like, wow, this could help me because you know, find the idea is okay. So with this Victoria's Secrets um award, we looked at is it feasible? We had like a N of twelve, like a you now what's what's called a phase one, like a really small study where women just suffered mindset treatment. And then when you think about clinical trials, you do a phase one, which is super tiny, and then a phase two, which you know, is a little bit bigger, it's randomized, but you're still learning. And then the phase three is the one that's powered, you know, it's randomized and then you don't make mistakes. Um, so basically this R34 is a grant to help you plan that bigger randomized trial that will be defining. Um, and you know, when you, when you, when you uh, attend the, the planning grant, they kind of just tell you exactly what they're looking for. They're like, these are the type of aims, you know? Um, and of course, the devil's in the details. So this took a lot of writing. Um, but because I'd had experience writing this K99, you know, two or three years later, earlier, it was not as hard. But, again, you know, again, what I submitted was, you know, 15th draft compared to my first one. So there were definitely months where my life was not great. <laughs> I was writing a lot. Uh, but, you know, I, I got funded on the first try, the... Um, the I think my score was 19 or something or 18 or 19, which is fundable. And you know, and then of course what you learn, your department loves it when you get NIH grants. And you might wonder why. It's because they it's you know big indirects. Anyway, um, but this was really exciting um and gave me the confidence like, wow, I can actually write an NIH grant and and get funded and you know get more than half a million dollars. Um so, you know, the point is, it's doable. It just takes a lot of investment, a lot of writing, a lot of, you know, failing repeatedly, meaning like you get a draft back from your mentor and, you know, there's a lot of red, <laughs> but the more you do it, um, the better it becomes. Um, 
So um, Racing Grants is one thing, publications is definitely the second. Um, and you know, uh, departments like both, um, and certainly for promotion, you need the publications. Um, and um, so this is kind of you know my PubMed. Um, and there's always, you know, the, sometimes when you write too many grants and you, you're not writing papers. So one of the feedback I've gotten from my mentors often, especially you know, in fellowship earlier is that you're not writing enough papers because you're writing too many grants. <laughs> but it also feels nice to like get funded and it's like, oh, write another grant, write another grant. But, you know, but you actually you should be promoted in new papers. So, so, you know, um, so my first paper publication was in 2013. That was from the year I took in, off of med school to do research. And then basically I was in residency where you just don't have time to write. Um, and then I started my fellowship in 2018. Um, and so then 2019 I had two publications. Um, and, you know, and then basically my fellowship years, I didn't have that many publications, um, but, you know, in part because, you know, and this is a strategy thing, like when, you, when you're doing your fellowship, are you starting a project or are you using secondary data? If your fellowship is based on secondary data, which means you start your fellowship and the data is already there, then, you know, you can just like hit the ground running and having publications. Um, I took a slightly riskier path where I, I was like, I'm going to set up an, a, a study and, you know, hire people, write IRB. And that whole thing takes like eight months, which that's why they tend to discourage you from doing like primary data for especially a short fellowship. Um, so anyway, so, you know, my fellowship, because I took a path where I was like generating primary data, I didn't have a lot of time to publish, but eventually, you know, they came through. So I joined the faculty in 2021. Um, and on that year I had five, five publications, but those were probably publications from, so, you know, when you start a project in 2018, you tend to not publish it until like three years later, because, you know, depending on the length. Um, so, you know, there's always sort of some strategy around that. Um, and then most recently, I've had a lot more publications because I've, you know, stuff builds. Um, for example, my primary fellowship project that I did when I was on Glocal, she just got uh, published last year. So almost five years later, you know, I, I, submit, I presented it as an abstract like two years previously, and then I got distracted writing grants. <laughs> but anyway, it's just a balance. Um, but the goal is, you know, you do both. And oftentimes your, your grants you know, at least at the background of your papers. Um, so again, you know, I'm gonna now start to wrap up. Uh, this is the writing business, you know, you, you know, I love seeing patients. I love doing community work. I love going to meetings and networking. It's definitely better than sitting in front of your computer and like trying to put sentences down. But re at the end of the day, and this took me a while um, to appreciate, people who make change, like, you know, the things that make change, at least in science, is like that good RCT that like changes the game. Um, at least, you know, you know, so, you know, guidelines, definitely sure people will listen when you have a really good study that's very robust. So, you know, my goal is eventually to have a really strong phase three trial that's randomized, ideally multi-country, that shows that African women or women in those settings can use a self-administer treatment to treat pre-cancer and um, have better outcomes than sending them to a referral facility where they'll never go or rely on a healthcare worker who's overburdened. And I know, and you you can't get there if you're just seeing patients all the time or if you're going to meetings and having nice conversations. You know, you have to get the small grants to do those tiny feasibility studies, to have a team that then will do that phase two, and then to eventually, you know, be able to have a few million to do that phase three that then will change the game um, and this all just comes with like embracing that like <laughs> loneliness of like, oh, I have to sit down and write. Um, so prioritizing that, especially at the beginning, because later on, if you have tenure and your, your name is established, then you can do all the more exciting things. Um, but initially like focusing on writing, reading widely, you know, attend conferences very still and then go selective. Like now when I attend conferences, I don't go to all the, the talks. I go to very selective talks and then I go back to my room and write notes and like, you know, um, like being like being really strategic. Um, because you know at the end of the day you wanna be able to like, how is this feeding into something that I'll write that will support my work? Um and then persistence, you know, it's just never, it gets easier eventually, but certainly not easy for me yet. I like this idea of fall forward, you know, like learn the lessons. It's painful when you get that rejection, but you learn it and you keep moving. Um, 
again, investing in yourself, um, you know, you again when you finish residency or training, you tend to be a very good. And my perspective is being a resident, or so even you finish a PhD. But you, did, you know, as a as a physician, you're a very good surgeon, but you're not a great writer. You don't know how to lead a team. Like, how do you, like, you know, when, now when I have a team, people who are doing research, I have to do evaluations, I have to set standards, I have to how do I fire somebody? How do I, you know, like nobody teaches you these things. And ideally things like this fellowship should teach you those things. But eventually later you, and I think as faculty, and even as faculty, you just, yeah, you have to find opportunities to learn to lead a team um, because you can't do everything on your own. Again, people who are really successful, you know, that New England Journal first author who's, you know, they have a team of people behind them who are doing, you know, statistics, they see the patients, they do the quality, da, da, da. So you know you have to invest in how do you, how do you become a leader and how do you lead people as well as you know you bring in the grants but also lead people. Um, you know I you know there's a there's a phrase that says successful leaders are made not born or something and I think also research just similar with research you just learn this and I've had to pay out of my own pocket to do career coaching on some of these things of like. Just, you know, a lot of these things that we're talking about, writing courses, et cetera, how to, you know, and then being productive, how to write better, like, you know, that's something I'm still learning, like, how can you write something in two hours instead of four or six? <laughs> how do you not check the, you know, check CNN all the time when you're working? Um, you know, something, this last bullet point, you know, learning how to manage money. So, you know, when you get grants, you get money and, you know, it's, it's, you know there's definitely, it's like power and opportunity and, and, and potential to do things. But how do you manage? How do you make a budget? And, you know, things will go wrong, like the ID is delayed. And then, you know, it's a little scary, you know, especially unless you came from money and had like a bank account that you had to manage. Um, so you have to learn to, man learn to manage money and to manage risk. Um, you know, like the, like, yeah, like, um, you know, you pay for something to ship something and then like the whole shipment like gets messed up. You just lost $10,000. Oh my God. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, you, of course you use your mentors. Um, um, and then this whole thing, I think is like being comfortable with risk. And I talk about this because, um, from, you know, when I finished residency in 2018, mm -hmm. I was a great surgeon and I was like, could do a hysterectomy really quickly. And then I was like, well, if I'm just doing hysterectomies in San Francisco, I'm not going to impact the women that I want to impact. So then I was like, okay, I want to do research because if I do research and my work is important and meaningful, it'll you know change the lives of women, both in San Francisco and other places. But then over the last you know six years or something, since I, the more I become a researcher, certainly I'm not going to get same surgeon. Um, and, and I'm taking the bet that by, you know, in, pushing time on research, um, I will continue to get the grants um, that I can pay for my salary. You know, it's like, it's definitely a risky thing um, because, you know, you're living short, you know, the security, you know, you did four years of residency to become a surgeon. Um, and then now you're starting a whole new thing, but it, it's, it's, but it's what sets my heart on fire. So it's being comfortable with that uncertainty, with, you know, being comfortable with some risk or some anxiety and, and, you know, you know, and, and others have taken this path. It's not the easiest. So availing yourself of mentors and opportunities to help you realize it can be done. Um, and then, you, you know, you know, if for some reason I, yeah. So, you know, it's, it's worth the risk and being comfortable with it. Um, and that I think a lot of people don't keep going because they're like, why wow, I have to write a grant to pay for my salary. <laughs> like, you know, that's really weird. Cause you know, you, it's, there's no other job where you do that. Um, so, that aspect of investing in yourself. Um, you know, I'm still learning a lot how to write efficiently. I still take too long to write. I'm still learning how to build good teams. How do you interview people, find the right person? How do you, you know, kind of um, help translate the values that you have or the vision that you have to your team so that they can work well? Because if they work well, um, then you're, you're all successful and your work and your mission is successful. How do you work with collaborators? Um, and do it in a way that is, you know, it's not exploitative, et cetera. Um, how, you know, there's how to raise money outside of traditional grants. So, you know, in, in academia, we are taught like NIH, so there's a lot of money, like, you know, an R01, which is like a big grant, is like half a million a year for five years, a lot of money. Uh, but, you know, to successfully write an R01, you know, it might take a year and a half of like writing. 
Um, but sometimes, you know, when you, another way to raise money for your work is philanthropy. And, and that also, that tends to involve being out there as well, like how to pitch your ideas, how to, you know, talk to people, how to tell a story. Um, so something that I hope to do in my future is to take some courses around that because you might meet somebody who has money and they'll give you, you know, 300,000 after talking to them passionately for 30 minutes <laughs> versus taking, you know, 60 hours of writing to get that same money from a foundation. So, you know, there's different ways to, to get, to ra um, raise money. Um, and then balance is always tricky. I definitely say I've not found it uh, yet. Um, you know, you can work all the time. You don't want to um, increasingly having, you know, taking my weekends off and having boundaries. And that tends to come when you, you know, when you have other people who are helping you, then you can you don't have to do everything. Um, so, you know, some, so, something to always start earlier. Um, so I'll start, I'll, I'll end how I started, you know, know your why. This is a writing business. This is a small business, like a small business. You have to invest in yourself and see yourself and the skills you have to put in time, put in, you know, some money to like, this is a skill that I don't have. You know, I'm going to go and get coached on this. Sometimes you just pay for that out of your pockets, et cetera, or, you know, premier grants if you can allow it. Um, embracing specificity, don't change topics too quickly. Like some of the stuff builds on itself and it takes you know, like years to know the literature in an area to be able to write strong work. Um, so, you know, that's why people tend to have careers in the same area and they know the literature cold because <laughs> they've been reading the same papers and like, oh, you follow this person. And um, so, you know, you can't do that if you're like working on TB tomorrow, HIV the next day, diabetes the next day, <laughs> like you need to really stay focused because then your, your, your writing and your papers becomes easier. Um, and also, you know, you, you build a name in that area. Um, and then lastly, I, I also really like this is like your weakness is your superpower. And this is also something that I come across and um, somebody mentioned. Um, and, you know, um, when I, I said when I was in residency, it was like the hardest time of my life. You know, I you know, was an immigrant working in like this um, American system where, you know, I was a woman, I was soft-spoken, I had an accent and like all these things like, you know, that were quote unquote, a weakness for, you know, for me, like I, I definitely, you know, got situations where I didn't think I was treated fairly because I was different. Um, but, you know, on the other hand, when I'm now doing this work and, you know, it's those things, it's the fact that, you know, I spent the first 18 years of my life growing up in Africa and seeing, you know, that I can walk into spaces, I can go to like, it's like gates meetings and like, I can like say something that like, you know, has a lot more meaning because of my experience um so what was quote unquote a weakness you know in a social environment now you know opens a lot of doors for me because you know not your lived experiences are really important um and at the end of the day like somebody sitting in Bethesda or New York you know have not you know their ideas in solving problems in Africa are just not the same as somebody who's been there um so you know I, I try to to tell that to people that um you know as you move along, um, you know, whatever you see as like is a is a deficit oftentimes can be eventually what propels you. Um, this final quote is one that I actually also heard from the, the author is Arch Williams, but this was told by somebody who was previously a Gorka fellow who now is faculty at Duke and very successful cardiologist. And he was talking about his global health career. And he basically said, you know, I'm not telling you it's going to be easy, but I'm I'm telling you it's going to be worth it. So, you know, I, I'm still pretty early. It's not been easy, but so far it's been really worth it. Um, and it's certainly worth the sacrifices. So, you know, I hope you all learned something and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Wow, that was that was awesome. And thank you for sharing your journey. And this is really, you know, impressive. And congratulations on all your accomplishments, uh, really appreciated you sharing. Uh, so yeah, we have, um, you know, a little over 10 minutes for questions and reflections for Dr. Mungo. Um, it was really, um, I thought it was just really inspirational. Um, and just to start us off, I think um, I really appreciated you starting with the why and how 
you were very proactive in terms of uh, looking for funding opportunities that are very uh, diverse. So I think that's also a really critical lesson for all of us. So usually we just focus on NIH, but you know, given your success and getting awards from Gilead, Google Scholar, and also Victoria's Secret, I think it's it's a really um, you know unique opportunity for all of us to consider. So, and I think uh, the way that you align the funding opportunity with your specificity. So, I think that was really really also very key where you are intentional on furthering your work, but not just going for the funding opportunity because there's a funding opportunity, but aligning with your interests and your passion. So I thought that was really um, awesome. It's not a question, but just a comment. So really appreciate it. Um, okay, so we have, uh, so let's see, any questions for Dr. Mungo? So we have, um, you know, laudatory comments and appreciation in the chat. Um, yeah, I have to take any and all questions. <laughs> Gamma, did you have a comment? And it looks like you're unmuted. Or no? No, oh, no um, I don't have. I don't have a comment. Just. Uh, um, yeah, just it was a great talk. I'm um, sorry, unmuted by mistake. Thank you. No worries. Any other comments, thoughts, questions? I'll ask okay. a question if you don't mind. I see okay. one in the chat as well. But That's okay. Vina, um, go ahead and then we can field house question. Sure. Um, so thanks again, Dr. Mungo, for your talk. Really appreciate it. My name is Vina. I'm currently a medical student, also planning to go into OBGYN, so definitely appreciated hearing about your path. <clears throat> I just wanted to ask if you could talk a little bit more about the point about embracing specificity and specificity being a strength. Um, how specific is specific, especially like, because I feel like I'm so early on in my training, really figuring out what I want my career to look like and trying to figure out balancing having a niche versus being kind of feeling siloed into that. Were there times that you felt like you had other interests that you didn't have the bandwidth to expand to? Or was it, were there times that it was harder to start a project because you were seen as somebody who had experience in this other field? How did you kind of navigate that? I just want to hear more about that point. Thank you so much again. Yeah, thank you. It's a great question. Um, definitely something that, um, you know, and use your mentors. And if you have specifics, happy to reach out to me. But so some examples, yeah, so you you know you want to stay in the same subject area ideally. Um, so you know I began working with cervical cancer. Um, my first publication was in it, and then um, when I was in fellowship, I worked on it. You know, and then within cervical cancer, there's a lot so you can do vaccination, secondary prevention. Da -da. So certainly, you know, if you've spent five years in an area like jumping, to, like if you jump, for example, to breast cancer, it's completely different. Like. You know, it takes a while to know the literature to be able to speak well or, you know, at least intelligently, um, or even within cervical cancer, for example. So when I, you know, one of the, the tiny pilot grants I wrote um, as a fellow was looking at, there's a lot of excitement, for example, around AI, um, and can you take an image of the cervix and use AI to to diagnose it? Um, so one of the tiny um 50,000 grants I wrote was, you know, looking at feasibility, can nurses take a good picture, are women comfortable with pictures taken, um, and when I was writing my case, I, you know, like the AI things were changed, but, you know, if you, if you want to work in AI and images, it's too, you know, it's so different from, like, what I, you know, love AI, like, I don't like physics, and, like, you know, learning a lot of, like, the depth, like, you know, to, you want to know the depth of, like, how, you know, AI works and you know, machine model learning. And so I was like, this is really exciting. It'd be great to have, you know, uh, have the tools where somebody can take a picture in a rural place and can get a diagnosis, but I'm not gonna put my time into being an expert in large language models because <laughs> that means even more time away from patients versus I'd rather work on a clinical trial where women are using a self-administered treatment because that means I spending more time with women and um, and it's more in line, you know, I don't have a physics background. So that's like an example of like 
you know, even within Storm Kukasa, how do you choose? And and you can't like be like, oh, I'm writing AI stuff today and then tomorrow I'm writing this because you just, you know, there's not enough hours in a day to be good at both. Um, so so as you, you know, and then even within Storm Kukasa, there's like microbiome, there's other things that affect ability to clear HPV and to be a microbiome researcher, that takes a lot. So even now, like when we do trials, I'll collect samples and I'll work with the somebody who's a microbiome expert. Cause I'm like, I'm not trying to be a microbiome expert because that means that another 10 years of going in the microbiome. But, you know, so as you progress and I'm happy to help you think through it more closely, you, you'll find a where it's like, all right, you know, this aligns with what I, I want, I like to do. It builds on my background and I, you know, versus so like the AI thing was like too, too different. And I didn't want to like invest in something completely different. So, yeah. So like even within the same field, try to stick on things that build on each other. And then eventually you can find collaborators who can work on an aspect that affects your work. Um, I hope that's helpful, but I can also talk offline. Thank you. All Very right. Helpful. Thank you so much. And and there's a question from Hao about um, the amount of time it took for you to prepare for the K99 application. Yeah, so definitely at least a year. Um, um, so, you know, I'd say three to four months of thinking through different um, aims, like what your focus will be. And then once you've, you know, and, you know, so you read and, you know, and then going to conferences, et cetera. Um, and then once you've set on your thing, on your aims, I'd say giving yourself a six months where, you know, you have, it's most of what you're doing most of the time, not all, you know, you still be writing some papers and, you know, whatever. But um, I'd say, you know, the goal, you know, give yourself at least six, eight months where this is a lot of what you're doing. Um, you know, you can never have more time. And often we think we can do it quicker, especially when it's the first time. Uh, so if possible, definitely get more than one year from your goal call and then have, you know, at least a six, eight month look where you're like primarily doing research and writing around, um, you know, around your, around your grant. Well, again, thank you so much for spending the time, especially at, at an airport. Uh, this was really great and um, really appreciate your perspectives. And um, Okay, so Charles, you have the last um, comment or question. Yeah, thank you. Um, great uh, presentation and sharing your journey. Um, I think one of the things you reiterate is uh, maintaining focus um, as you build uh, your career. But uh, in many of our uh, resource limited research settings in many LMICs, uh, you find that uh, you, you know, the resources dictate where you go and uh, it's, it's kind of challenging. Uh, to you know focus on an area where especially you don't have many mentors within your own setting so that means uh, um, you may not be in an environment in a in a research um, team or group that has um, money and um, you also don't have that profile at the moment that can attract as much um, money. And so it becomes difficult. You'll find that uh, eventually you have to drift to where the resources are. Um, any thoughts on, uh, you know, how you could, uh, any, you know, any ideas on how, you know, you can withstand that and still maintain focus? Um, I know you've talked about, you know, not only writing grants and publishing here and there, but uh, anything else? Yeah. Yeah, this is definitely a challenge. And I think um, I or others would be great for others, especially others who are fully based in LMICs to talk about how they've managed this issue. Um, I think the truth is definitely one has to be strategic. 
like there's definitely a lot of money in HIV. So if your work, you know, so intersects with HIV, you have more opportunities for funding, you know, funding opportunities, RFAs. Um, so for example, obstetric fistula is a, you know, it's an OB thing that's a problem, but there's just not enough funding in OB fistula. So, you know, sometimes in, in part of how I end up working in HIV is because my mentors were also working in HIV because it was more funded. Um, so I think, you know, it's just the reality that one has to be um, uh, creative or uh, strategic. Um, and, and within HIV, there's a lot of, you know, if you're interested in metabolics in you know, implementation science, et cetera. So at the end of, I think, yeah, like, you know, find an area that's fundable and then find what's within it, um, it's, you know, is exciting for you. Um, and then I think, you know, the NIH is increasingly working on opening funding opportunities to be irrespective of, um, of citizenship status. So anybody, anywhere, you know, if you're a strong writer it's, and you can, you know, invest, you, you know, pre present a good application, you can get funded. Um, so I don't have the best answer. I think it's definitely true to be strategic and see in an area that there's funding, but there's so many problems, um, like, you know, HIV, so HIV cancer is increasingly getting funded, the National Cancer Institute and the global, um, the um, NCI Global Cancer Program is, you know, has a, and the lead of that program, somebody who spends a lot of time in Malawi, very much understands and invests, invested in African and, and, and international investigators. So cancer is getting more attention. So I think staying within, have your career and your CV make sense. <laughs> so you're, you're strategic, but you also you're not too tangential. Um, of course, sometimes you might need to take a job, you know, or an FTE on a project that, um, is maybe diabetes or something, but try to make it connected so that when you like write your bio sketch, there's a coherent story because um, people tend to want to see that coherent story in your work to get the confidence to find you. Okay, well, thank you so much. Uh, we are out of time. There was a comment from Archana uh, just uh, saying thank you. Um, and if it's okay, maybe the fellows can reach out to you offline. Um, so yeah, so thanks again and, um, have a wonderful rest of your evening, morning. Um, and, uh, Kimberly, do we have our next, uh, career development seminar scheduled? Yes, that will be the first Thursday of June. That will be okay. our last one. Yes. Okay. And before that, we'll of course have the works in progress in two weeks. Okay. Sounds good. All right. Well, thank you all. And thanks again. Appreciate mm -hmm. you. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.